For some reason, the skills that you learn in class aren't necessarily the skills that you need for an engineering job. For example, you'll find yourself learning about Cauchy Euler's ordinary differential equation in class, then be expected to design a plastic enclosure for electronics at work. So clearly there's a gap between what you learn in your engineering classes and what you need to know at work. So this video aims to fill that gap by sharing 7 engineering skills that you need to get good at. And no, I'm not gonna say skills like communication, creativity, problem solving, public speaking, etc. These soft skills are kind of obvious and skills that really everyone needs to be successful. That being said, we got four main non-negotiable tangible skills that you need to get pretty good at. And these are CADing, coding, Arduino or breadboarding, and 3D printing. For CADing, being familiar with CAD software like Fusion 360 or SOLIDWORKS is pretty important. But if you're a beginner, then you can try a software like FreeCAD, which is again a free CAD software, and you can download it on both Mac and Windows. You can start off with the basics, learning how to make simple shapes, then move on and follow tutorials on YouTube that will teach you how to make more complicated shapes. Keep in mind that FreeCAD isn't a CAD software that you'll use in a professional setting like at work, because usually at work we'll use SOLIDWORKS or CATIA for example, but FreeCAD is good enough as a beginner because it teaches you the basics of CAD in three ways. First, it gives you experience on designing things for the real world. It allows you to work with real units like meters or inches. It also allows you to design things that you can then 3D print, laser cut or CNC machine. That way your design can actually become a reality. Second, it'll teach you about all the different file formats we work with. We have step files, STL files, drawing files, DXF files, etc. They each have a purpose and you need to be familiar with all of them. For example, when 3D printing, you need to convert your design to an STL file. Third, when CADing, you use features like cut, extrude, loft, etc. And the more experience you have using them, the better you'll get at CADing, regardless of the CAD software you're using. With coding, I am by no means an expert, but I was first introduced to it when I was 13 years old, where I learned about Scratch and Python. I then learned C++ in my first year of university. Now, if you haven't heard of Scratch before, it's literally a programming language for kids we learn coding at a very high level. It was the first ever exposure I had to coding and I think it was really beneficial because it taught me how to think logically when it comes to creating code without worrying too much about syntax. It's because you're not worrying too much about semicolons or how to write certain things. Instead, you're just dragging and dropping the code to create whatever program you're trying to make. Also, it's free and with it, you can build some pretty basic projects, which is a pretty cool feeling. Once I mastered that, I then moved on to Python where I learned some coding basics like pseudocode, variables and how to manipulate them, if statements, loops, arrays, functions, how to import them and make my own, data structures and recursion. So if you're an absolute beginner, I'd say start with scratch, do some basic projects to help you think logically like how a programmer would. Then move on and use an actual programming language like C++, Python, or even Java. I've never used Java before, but apparently it's the same sort of difficulty level as Python and C++. Out of those three, just pick the one where the syntax just makes the most sense to you. Then find a tutorial online that teaches the coding basics of that language. Use that knowledge to build some pretty cool projects. And you could even follow along YouTube tutorials to build something simple just to get started. Next skill is becoming familiar with basic electronics like Arduino and breadboards just to be able to build simple circuits. You can get some breadboards, wires, resistors, switches, LEDs, etc. for about $20 or so. Then get a pretty inexpensive Arduino from Amazon for like another $25. The reason I recommend getting an Arduino is because you can work on some really cool projects with it. And the Arduino IDE where you'll be writing code is pretty simple and a little intuitive. And it also works on Mac, Linux, and Windows. You can then put some of the projects that you worked with, you know, using these electronics or the Arduino on your resume or portfolio. Because it shows the hiring manager that this person actually knows what they're talking about and they have some experience building things. But if you're still curious and are confused on where to get started, you should go to Adafruit's website because it has a lot of lessons that introduces you on how to use LEDs, LCD displays, as well as DC motors and stepper motors in any project. And if you need some inspiration on cool ideas to build, the internet is filled with a bunch of projects and tutorials that you can try for yourself. You can build projects like a heartbeat sensor, a wireless doorbell, an RC car, or even a thermometer. Moving on, we have 3D printing, which I think is a pretty important skill because it can allow you to build tangible things really, really quickly. 
So it's important to understand how it works and all the different 3D printing methods out there. For a quick overview, the three most common or popular types of 3D printing are stereolithography or SLA for short, selective laser sintering or SLS for short, and fused deposition modeling or FDM for short. As you can tell, engineers love their acronyms. Those three processes 3D print plastic parts. You start off by designing a part in a CAD software, then turning that part into an STL file. Once that's complete, you can use a slicing software like Cura for example, to organize the parts that will be printed. You use this slicing software to select the material that the part will be made out of, how thick it will be, and a bunch of other properties. Now let's go back to the three 3D printing processes we mentioned earlier. SLA 3D printing works by filling the bottom with a liquid resin. Then a UV laser beam is directed at a mirror. This mirror has a motor that can allow you to precisely aim the laser. This laser then cures the resin layer by layer until we build the shape that we want. Now moving on, SLS 3D printing works by filling a container with nylon powder. Then again, a laser beam is directed at a mirror which is attached to a motor that can allow you to precisely aim the laser. This laser then centers each layer of the part. This happens for every layer until we build the shape that we want. Finally, FDM 3D printing is a little different than the other two because in this process, we start off by taking a spool of plastic filament, then melting it. This melted plastic then comes out of a nozzle and builds each layer of the part from the bottom up on a heated bed. You can use your 3D printers at your school when you're first starting out, or you can also buy your own 3D printer. They're not that expensive. You can get this one called the Creality Ender 3, and it's just under $200. But again, if you're a broke student, then try using some of the printers that they have at your university or your high school even. So learning the four skills I mentioned so far, CADing, coding, Arduino, breadboarding, and 3D printing will allow you to build some pretty cool projects that you can then put on your resume and your portfolio, which will really, really impress a hiring manager, especially if this is your first ever internship that you're applying to. Also, mastering these four skills will allow you to be a pretty well-rounded engineer, especially early on in your career where you really have no idea what kind of engineering you want to get into. However, if you're mechanical, your focus should definitely be more towards CADing and 3D printing, whereas if you're in electrical, then your focus should be more on circuits, Arduino, and breadboarding, and if you're in software, obviously you should be focused more on coding than any of the other skills. Now, when solving a problem, whether it's in an engineering interview or an engineering job, it's important to have a critical thinking approach and be able to demonstrate that to your manager or to your interviewer. The most common way that's done in an engineering setting is by going through a product development process, which can be broken down into six steps. One, define the problem and gather all your givens. Two, create a list of requirements needed to solve the problem based on the givens. Three, create a few concepts that satisfy the requirements. Four, turn these concepts into prototypes or create a mathematical model. Five, create a testing procedure to make sure the prototypes or models meet the requirements you made in step two. Six, once you've had a successful prototype, which may take several, several iterations, you can head into launch and production. For example, let's say you're given a task to design a waterproof enclosure for a bunch of electronics. You'd start off by realizing that the problem is that water keeps coming in contact with all these electronics, causing them to fail and eventually need to be replaced. So you then move on and gather information about this entire problem by looking at how big the enclosure needs to be, what kind of electronics are you working with here, and what surrounding parts is this enclosure going to need to interact with. Then you can jump into sketching a few concepts, then catting some of these concepts and eventually 3D printing some prototypes. And honestly, you don't necessarily need to 3D print these prototypes, you can obviously have them made at a shop nearby, which is probably smarter because if it needs to be waterproof, then making them out of plastic filament from a 3D printer isn't the best idea here. Anyways, with a few prototypes in hand now, you can create a water ingress testing procedure to see how well your prototype actually does its job and meets the requirements. Now again, this is a very high level example, but it's still important to show your thought process for any problem that you need to solve in an engineering setting. In almost any technical engineering interview you're gonna have to do, they're gonna ask you to solve some engineering problems. And they don't really wanna see your answer, they just wanna see the thought process you take to get to an answer. It doesn't necessarily have to be the right answer, they just wanna see how you think and your entire critical thinking process. Moving on, another important tangible skill that I think a lot of engineers need to have is the ability to use tools. Now we have two types of tools, hand tools and shop tools. Hand tools can be broken down into four groups. 
First, we have measuring tools like calipers, compasses, levels, and tape measures. Second, we have manipulation tools like screwdrivers, hammers, pliers, wrenches, and allen keys. Third, we have stabilization tools like clamps and vices. Fourth, we have division tools like drills, knives, saws, sanders, and files. Regardless of what type of engineering you're in, even software, I still think it's important to be able to use these tools and know what each tool's purpose is, just in case you need to build or test something with them. Moving on, the other set of tools that we have are shop tools. These tools are much more complicated equipment and usually require some kind of training. These tools include things like drill presses, deburring machines, lathes, milling machines, bandsaws, belt sanders, sheet metal equipment, etc. Now, not every engineering major needs to know how to use this equipment, but I think if you really enjoy hands-on work, then you should become familiar with them. So if you're in software engineering, for example, you probably don't need to know how to use a milling machine. Now, because engineering is a very practical field, I try my best to just share tangible and practical skills that you can work on. But there are two quote-unquote soft skills that are worth mentioning here, and those are networking and self-education. First, let's look at networking. When I say networking, I'm not talking about going to career fairs and just handing out your resume. That's nice, but that's not real networking. Imagine I drop you in a room full of complete strangers and I ask you to spend the evening there. After maybe four or five hours or so, how many people have you talked to? How many general conversations did you have? And how many people do you plan on staying in touch with afterwards? Ideally, if you have some pretty good networking skills, you would have had a lot of good genuine conversation and you would have stayed in touch with a great amount of people there with no expectation from them. Don't just stay in touch with someone because you think they'll be able to get you a job at Apple soon. Instead, literally just stay in touch with someone for the sake of staying in touch. Get their Instagram number or LinkedIn and just have that connection. Your network will really go a long way. The more people you meet there and the more friends you make, the greater chance you have for creating serendipitous opportunities. The reason I know this is effective because a lot of the people hired at the startup that I currently work for or at some of the companies that I worked for in the past usually get hired on through connections. For example, if we're looking to hire a systems engineer and one of my coworkers knows one that he worked with in the past, we'll most likely interview them and if they're good, we'll give them the job offer before even posting it online in our careers website. The second skill is self-education. Maybe you saw this one coming, but really all the tangible skills I mentioned so far require a lot of self-learning since we don't learn a lot of them in class. So you'll have to find online tutorials on them and do a ton of practice on your own. Anyways, I hope this video brought you value. If it did, check out this video where I share the eight traps that engineering students fall into, or check out that video where I share the career levels in engineering. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Peace.